Hey guys, it's Miss Batty here, back with our third lesson in the series on populations and resources. Before we get started with our lesson today, I wanted to give you a chance to do a little check-in about what we've learned so far. Here we have a graph of a U.S. honeybee population. As we can see, the population of honeybees in the United States was stable for a period of time. However, at a point, it started to rapidly decrease. What does this mean and how did this occur? Using what we've learned so far, let's see if we can figure out the answer to some check-in questions. Which statement best describes births and deaths when the honeybee population was stable? There were the same amount of births and deaths, there were more births than deaths, or there were fewer births than deaths. I'm gonna give you a second to think about this for yourself. Hmm. Okay, did you get the same idea as me? There were the same amount of births and deaths in the population. Just like in our model that we saw in the video, where water was coming in to the tank and going out, and the water level remained stable, the same is occurring with the honeybee populations. Births are going in, and honeybees are also dying, maintaining that stability in the population. So what is happening that is causing the population to decrease? The same amount of births and deaths? It seems like we could cross that one off if that is what is happening when it's stable. There were more births than deaths, or there were fewer births than deaths? Hmm. That's right, there were fewer births than deaths in the population, meaning that there were more deaths than births. What you're gonna need for the lesson today is a pencil or pen, some lined or blank paper, or if you have the packet pages available to you for lesson three, you can go ahead and get those out right now as well. Something that's optional, but encouraged, just like every time we do this, is to have a family member or a friend that you can chat and check in with over the next little bit. We're gonna be analyzing some evidence, so it'll be really useful to see if others are agreeing with your thinking during this time. Recently, we learned that Dr. Robinson believes that there is an increase in the moon jelly populations that she studies. But something that I've been wondering is how does she get this information? Let's watch a video on how ecologists like Dr. Robinson studied population sizes using something called population sampling. Enjoy. Today we're at the Louisiana University Marine Consortium, which is the main center for marine science research in Louisiana. So if we want to understand whether jellyfish populations are increasing or decreasing, it would not be a very effective method for me to sit here and watch the jellyfish float by counting them one by one. What we really need to do is go out into the ecosystem, and to do that, we need to get on a boat. So today we're going to use the RV Acadiana and go out and try a couple different collection methods that are much more efficient. All right, here we go. We got Captain Carl and the RV Acadiana. All right, you ready to go? All right, let's get out of here. One of the ways that we can collect jellyfish is just directly, which is using a dip net. The way that we do this is we just take a large net that you would use for fishing and we have a spotter and they just look for jellyfish that are close to the surface of the water. Oh, I see one! Oh, I got it! All right, I'm going to track it. Got it! All right, I need a bucket. So after we finish dip netting them, we'll um, sometimes we'll take them out of the bucket and we'll measure them. And after we finish with it, we take the jellyfish and we put it back in the ocean. There you go. So this dip netting method is really um, great for helping us answer questions that are about individual organisms, but it's not um, effective for answering questions that are about the population. So we use a technique called trawling to collect jellies from many different places. The technique of trawling has multiple steps. 
The first step is we throw out the cotton, which is the back of the net, and the net gets fed out the back of the boat. So then we tow the net for a set period, and then we haul the net in. Okay, so we got um, some fish here and we have three, nope, oh, looks like four, five moon jellies that we caught here in the trawl. We can use repeated sampling to estimate the number of jellies that are in our ecosystem. We go around to different places around our ecosystem and we put a trawl in and then we bring the trawl up and we count the number of jellyfish that are in that trawl. And so then we repeat this method multiple times. We then can generate an average estimate of the number of jellyfish that are in our ecosystem. Trawling is a technique that allows us to capture the number and the distribution of jellyfish in an instant. But if we want to understand how the jelly populations are changing in time, whether they're increasing or decreasing, we need to sample them repeatedly over time. So for example, where you can go out one month, let's say January, and we sample a set of sites, and then we'll go out February, and then we'll go out in March, and then by taking repeated samplings, we can then understand how their numbers are changing uh, through the year. And what this allows us to do is develop a time series that then can tell us whether jellyfish in the ecosystem are increasing or decreasing. So these time series that I'm talking about when we repeatedly sample jellyfish are actually very, very important to understanding long-term changes in not only jellyfish populations, but all ecosystem parameters, including fish, crab, shrimp, everything that we care about. But these time series are really hard to collect. Scientists need help from the citizens, but also we just need more scientists because the more people that we have monitoring our oceans, the more information we'll have and the closer and more quickly we can get to answers. So, you might have heard in the video that Dr. Robinson takes something called a sample of moon jellies. What a sample is, is a small part that is meant to show what the whole is like. You might have noticed that she used a net to gather her samples. Evidence is strong when the samples that they take represent as much of the whole as possible. When population ecologists are studying the populations that they study, they take samples in a lot of different areas and a lot of different samples so that they can get a clear of picture as possible. We're going to take a look at some data in a moment for our moon jelly populations and try to figure out what is the strongest piece of data for us to go off of. Here we have two pieces of evidence about moon jelly population samples. Both pieces of evidence were taken between 1980 and 2002. The ecologists counted moon jellies, and as you'll see, there are some differences between what the evidence showed and where the evidence was collected. I would like you to pause the video if you can, and this is a great time when you might wanna grab that family member or reach out to that friend to talk about what you think the evidence is telling you. I encourage you to jot down some notes or annotate a piece of paper uh, with your thinking about the two pieces of evidence we have here. Which is the strongest piece of evidence? What are these different evidence cards telling you about the moon jelly population? If you wanna keep playing the video and follow along with me, that's all right too. So I noticed that in evidence card A, I only see one sample site. He tells me that this is a collection location. And I also noticed that my graph seems to be kind of that straight line like we saw in the game that we played when populations were stable. If this is the population number, it doesn't really seem to be that different over here than it was in 1980. In evidence card B, I notice a lot more of these dots. I notice that they're out to sea, but also along the shore. That tells me that they took data from multiple different locations. Here, it seems that 
the moon jelly populations were stable for a while, but the graph over here looks a little bit different. This reminds me of the increasing population graph that we saw when we were playing the game. So what to believe? These seem to be saying different things. Well, if we go off our evidence criterion, that samples should represent the whole as much as possible to provide stronger evidence, then there really can be only one answer. Evidence card B does a great job of doing different locations in the glacier sea. There are some along the shore, some out to sea, some in the middle. There's such a variety of where they are taking their sample. Here, I only see one sample by the shore. In this area, the moon jellies may be staying really consistent, while the moon jellies a little further out from the shore might be completely disappearing or increasing. It's really hard to know what's going on just from looking at this one sample site. So if I am looking for the strongest evidence, I'm gonna go with moon jelly evidence B. And this backs up what Dr. Robinson is observing that the moon jellies are rapidly increasing in size. What is causing the size of the moon jelly populations in the Arctic Ocean to increase? We've learned a lot so far. We know that within a population, organisms are always born and always dying. If the number of births and deaths are equal in a given time, then we know that the population size will be equal and stable. If there are more births and deaths in a given time, then the population will increase. If there are more deaths than births in a given time, then the population will decrease. So what can we add to our thinking about what is going on in the moon jelly population? Using our new learning, I'd like you to pause the video and this would be a great time to discuss. What can we add to our understanding? What do we know about the births and deaths in the moon jelly population because we know that the moon jellies are increasing? Let's think for a second. Okay, so I was thinking that I see right here in one of our learnings that the population will increase if there are more births and deaths. What this tells me is that there must be more births and deaths in the moon jelly population. Now, what does this really mean? What is causing there to be more births than deaths? Are the births increasing? Or is it just that the deaths in the moon jellies are decreasing? Or are both happening at the same time? Why are these changes occurring? What was happening in the ecosystem where the moon jellies live for these changes to suddenly start occurring in 2000. We need to keep investigating and collecting evidence because although we figured one part out, as it usually does with science, it's led to a whole lot more other questions. In our next lesson, we are gonna continue our investigations to get more details about what is going on in our moon jelly populations. Something that I wanted to let you know is next time I'm going to be doing a lab investigation to investigate why more births might be occurring in the population. If you want to do it with me, the items that you'll need are yeast and sugar. Both of these might be lying around your house or are really easy to find at local grocery stores. If you don't have the materials or are not able to get them, no worries. You can follow along with me. I'm really looking forward to our next lesson and to continue learning with you. Bye.